This story really begins thousands of years ago in what anthropologists call deep time, the deep time of the dead. For the nomad, someone dies, you leave them in the sand, you leave them behind, literally, and you keep on walking. As we started building the first permanent settlements, you have this problem with what do you do with dead people? Where do you put them? Suddenly you have to deal with them. And whether you like it or not, they will continue to be present among you. One of these groups that went from nomadic to permanent settlements is the Natufians. And this really interesting burial custom emerged among them, where they would bury the dead underneath the very houses in which they live, but also they would remove the heads of the dead and remove all the flesh from the skull and replace it with plaster and then decorate it with seashells. And then they would keep the skull within the house, above ground, among the living. So after a couple of generations, Ufians would literally, in their homes, be surrounded by the skulls of generations of ancestors. These houses were usually built out of clay, so we say that they are permanent structures, but Really, they wouldn't maybe last more than a couple of generations, and then you would collapse that structure and build a new one on top of it. So not only would you build your house literally on a grave, but you would build a house upon a house upon a house until these were mounds. You were living with the past underneath you. churches, the dead were among you in the sense that they are buried inside the church. There are reports of how medieval churches would smell terribly of, of rotten flesh because the dead would literally be, be, be rottening inside the church. And if we look to the, the 19th and 20th uh, century, instead we have photos of the dead inside the house. But all of these ways of containing the dead have been, well, containers. There's a frame around the photograph, and we, we keep the dead in archives and in photo albums, or at least so we have been doing. With uh, the digital revolution, once again, we're living within the same structure. We all now live in and through the archive. We're once again on, on, in the same matrix as the dead are. We're, we're all in the internet. Haley's provided Apple with all of Steve's details, including their marriage certificate, his death certificate, a letter witnessed by JP, and another from her lawyer. But this rotten Apple has locked Haley and her daughter out of a lifetime of memories with their loved one. A mother is fighting the social networking site Facebook after her late daughter's account was altered without her permission. Terry, a woman, is going public this morning with her fight against Apple to get access to her late husband's account and the personal notes he'd stored in the cloud. She tells Rosa Marcatelli the company is putting up some very expensive Her father in the morning made a plea on YouTube.
it went viral. All he wanted to do was get a glimpse of his son's life through the eyes of Facebook. Well, following her husband's death in 2015, mum of one, Rachel Thompson, was told by tech giant Apple that she wouldn't be able to recover thousands of family photos and videos from his phone without a court order. I'm calling out to Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. My son passed away January 28th. twelve, and we can't access his Facebook account. All we want to do is see his movie. That's it. And it's been uh, memorialised without my consent. Right. There and Amy isn't there anymore, and it's it's just absolutely heartbreaking. I feel as if Amy's died again. Looking at that gap. without having a digital executor, as it were, and a legacy contact as somebody you specify in life that you'd like to be able to have, make certain choices about your profile after you die. For example, to be able to add new friends or to be able to change the uh, picture. I could have done that. Blocked him. I wasn't going to do that, but he did. Which meant I now no longer have access to her emails, which is useful for all sorts of things for me. I would want access to them. I would want to feel that I was custodian of her information. I'm not going to go reading them, but I would have access to her friends through the Gmail. It felt like a portcullis had clanged shut, like... Bang, you may not enter. That's it. All you can do, it says to me, all you can do now is look at this ghastly photograph if you're in Facebook. Access denied. As a mum, I could only view her account and use it as anyone else would. For me as her mum, I felt almost doubly bereaved because Somebody faceless had decided that this would happen now, and it has, and that's it. And I had no recourse. I had questions, but no one to ask. I didn't know what to do. It's possession is, access is, nine-tenths of the law, in the U.S. at least, when it comes to that content. One of the very first cases 16 years ago that I did in this area of law involved a young 18-year-old who was on their way to college on his motorcycle uh, from Oregon and uh, was in an accident and died. And the parents... Uh, really wanted access to his, what was then not really thought of, as like social media, whatever that was. But knowing that there were communications and stored content uh, and emails and the like, uh, they are very demanding about it. And um, of course, what the law said, it said, and they didn't understand and they wanted to uh, litigate over that issue. And it turned out there was a way to help them, but 
um, knowing everybody who received communications from the deceased and being able to go to them to get permission or to subpoena it through the estate uh, turned out very badly because the son wasn't who they thought he was. Um, a lot of information they found out that then became their last memories of him was uh, very disturbing. Um, the sister of the son who was living had very negative views of the mother and now a living person has an interaction with an, <laughs> the grieving mother and that was very disturbing and, and it became a metaphor for me in this whole practice which is you know be careful what you ask for you, you may not like it if you get it photos on her computer. It was very painful. I didn't know what I'd find on there. Tens of thousands of photos of herself. Selfies of herself looking at herself in the mirror. Looking sad, the next one crying, looking at herself. It was heartrending. My ex-husband's just gave me a box of her belongings this week, saying it's just rubbish in there, I don't want it. Well, rubbish. When I actually had a look, it was photo albums. It was precious things. It was little notes and diaries and cards from her friends. It was wonderful stuff that she thought was important enough to keep in a box with a lock. With resistance and loathing, but also with curiosity, I allow myself to imagine what it would be like to lose my own daughter at the age of 21. I picture a laptop or whatever device she'll use for her data in the year 2031, alongside the childish padlock secured diary she writes in now, both sitting on a table before me. Which would I feel comfortable opening and why? In 1923, after years of frustration and failure, the archeologist Howard Carter breached the seal of King Tut's tomb chipping away at the corner of a doorway that had been shut tight against intruders for millennia. As he held a candle to the opening, the dim beam of light fell onto the perfectly preserved objects that lay beyond. The financier of the expedition, Carter's employer, Lord Carnarvon, was hovering nearby and asked if he could see anything. Yes, breathed Carter. Wonderful things. A mere six weeks after the seal to the door of the tomb was broken, the Earl of Carnarvon was dead. Fueled by the popular press, the public's imagination was captured by Arthur Conan Doyle's hypothesis about his sudden demise. Carnarvon had been struck down by the curse of the pharaohs, a consequence of disturbing the repose of the dead royal. in an entirely new and endlessly complex environment we're finding it virtually impossible to understand all the risks benefits and trade-offs that affect our privacy in life much less in death when the boundaries set down by a living person are redrawn after they die the turbulence can be heavy indeed the hyperpersonal data left behind can be a source of great comfort or great pain 100 years after the archaeologist entered the tomb, as we enter the Valley of the Data of the Dead and push open the doors we find there, we too, like Lord Carnarvon, experience both the wonder and the curse. At the end of a life today, there can be lots of material relating to the digital life of the dead person that is not accessible to their bereaved. And the trials and tribulations of bereaved people trying to access this material is well documented. However, at the end of contemporary lives, there is often digital material relating to the life of the dead and our relationships to them that is accessible to the bereaved. 
What's interesting is that when we look at the role of this accessible digital material to the bereaved, its accessibility does not mean the bereaved will access it. Text messaging conversations with the dead, for example, that are still available to the bereaved, can be treasure troves of precious detail and connection to the person who has died. Their voice, turns of phrase, captured relational moments. But that very vividness can also be a too close encounter with the minutiae of exactly what has been lost. Some vividness can be best forgotten. Sometimes access to material is a burden and its loss a release. Grieving is about forming a story of the person who has died. However, these stories about our dead are not objective histories. They are stories told from our perspectives as their survivors. The story I tell about the person I am grieving is as much about me and how I want and need to think of myself as a sister, an aunt, a mother, a friend, as it is about the person who has died. When multiple people are grieving a life, their stories about the dead merge and compete, forming and reforming ongoing stories of the person who has died and who we are as they're bereaved. Digital material relation to our dead becomes part of this process of communally crafting a story of our dead and ourselves as they're bereaved. Text messages with the dead might be accessible to me, but I might not want to see them for fear they cast me in a bad light and challenge my idea of myself as a good sister, aunt, mother, friend. In fact, I might reject the possibility of accessing text messages with the dead outright as part of a narrative that my relationship with the dead was stronger than another survivor who is reliant on such material. Not accessing the material can support a narrative that ours was a closer relationship. Grieving happens in communities of people forming stories of their dead, of themselves and of each other. And the role of digital material in grief is as idiosyncratic, unique and unpredictable as the relationships and people involved. I guess I'll use the expression in the olden days. I used to laugh when my parents or my grandparents would talk about in the olden days. And now I use that expression to describe pre-social media and post-social media in, in the olden days. And still, to some extent, it's hard to find resources for support in the real world. Sometimes after a certain amount of time passes and that amount of time will change depending on the tolerance and the patience of the people in your life, sometimes it's hard to find an outlet for your grief. And social media provides that. Whether the real people in your life can tolerate your grief or not, you can go on a website, you can go on Facebook, you can go on any of your social media and post stories, thoughts, feelings, reactions, and you have the right to do that with you know, if that's something that helps you. The other thing that happens is sometimes the people in your real life aren't comfortable. They don't know what to say. They don't know how to help you. But sometimes people in an online community can do that. So the amount of social support that people find 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it's there. And, and that's something that you don't often have the gift of finding in the real world. So there's this, and, the, and that's why in the, the title of that article I wrote in 1997, it said social support inner networks, because that's what it was creating. It was, it was a place where you could go and find support for your loss. The flip side of that though, is sometimes the things that happen online are not helpful. You've got memorial trolls you who don't necessarily think that expressing your grief in public is okay because it's it's kind of this public versus private grief people have very different comfort levels and tendencies you know practices what's what's comfortable for you to do and unfortunately there are some people who don't believe it's appropriate who take that to an extreme will seek out memorial sites and kind of harass harangue uh, people who are choosing to express their grief in a public forum so that's one of those things on my list of of potential negatives if you have to be prepared for that to happen and one of the people that 
taught me about her experiences with using online resources to cope with grief, she described it as you have to have a thick skin. Because if it's helpful for you and you need to do it, that's your right. But there are some people who won't approve of it or appreciate it. And you have to be prepared for them to publicly um, criticize you, publicly humiliate you. And now we're learning about cyberbullying. And cyberbullying does happen on memorial websites or Twitter. A hologram of Michael Jackson appeared and performed last night at the Billboard Music Awards, almost five years after the singer's death. But while this might look like the future of posthumous performances, the trick itself is actually about five centuries old. The projection of Jackson materialized on a golden throne before launching into a performance of Slave to the Rhythm. There was moonwalking. There were taped fingers. There was dancing paramilitary cyborgs because, well, because. Jackson's One CEO has reported that his hologram company is frequently approached by the estates of dead musicians, particularly when the album sales and other revenue streams start to dry up. But what about ordinary folks? What if you'd like to carry on having an impact in the world yourself beyond just your family and friends? James Dean is making an unexpected return to the big screen thanks to CGI. Granted, if you're a regular sort of mortal and not a legendary performer, perhaps it's still a tad early for you to be thinking in holographic terms. But it could be arranged. In the online arena, you could be as vocal in death as you were in life, but to achieve that, surely you'll need to plan ahead. Well, perhaps not. Even if it's something that you'd never wanted, even if it's something that you couldn't even begin to imagine, the chances seem to be increasing that you just might find yourself digitally resurrected anyway. Look at you. You're 40 and all grown up. You look beautiful, just like when you were a little girl. I watch over you and your sisters and brother and the kids every day. Sometimes I drop hints that I'm around, like when you hear someone make a big pee or when you make a big pee Remember when I would drive you to school in my tiny Mercedes every day and we would listen to this song together? Well, this is the miracle of modern technology. Exactly right. Um, Kim Kardashian has just turned 40 years old and um, she's gone off to a private island where she's basically managed to get everyone to quarantine for a period of time, whatever else, to have this big 40th birthday bash. And just as everyone was getting over mocking the um, fairly tone deaf way in which she was boasting about doing that or at least discussing doing that. Uh, she then reveals that as part of the celebrations, her husband, um, Kanye West, you may have heard of him, um, surprised her with a hologram of her dead father, the uh, lawyer Robert um, Kardashian, who died in, I think, 2003, and who, of course, is probably best known um, in addition to being the father of the Kardashian children, but also best known for uh, defending O.J. Simpson at one point. This is a sort of a different situation where the deep faked <laughs> um, dead are foisted upon the uh, unsuspecting. In this case, thank goodness, at least for what she's saying on Instagram, it was a welcome surprise. A uh, public service announcement, it might not be in all instances, I'm reckoning. Mm. Yeah, and uh, there's uh, two interesting things there. One is, as you say, uh, foisting this on an unsuspecting um, person who is, is still grieving for um, their, their dead father. But there's also, I guess, a question here about who actually has the authority, if you like, to do that? Who gets to 
be close enough to that person to speak for them. Now, we don't necessarily know who else was involved. We don't know if any of the other Kardashian siblings, for instance, gave the go-ahead to this or uh, if this is something that Kanye has gone off and done on his own without reference to anyone else in the family. So we just don't know that. And I wouldn't want there to be an implication, which I don't think you were making, that then that permission from other family members would make it okay, I guess, or from Kim's perspective, because they couldn't have predicted that either. Every other member of the family could have gone, um, yeah, that sounds wonderful. Oh, that's so moving. That's such a good idea. Mm. That's great. That'll hit well. You know, that'll land well. And then it could have gotten to it, and that could have been the most horrifying thing that Kim could have ever imagined. And so there's an element here, too. People believing that they understand or know or can predict what another grieving person Mm. is going to want, value, and be okay with. Because it can sometimes be very hard to see past the ends of our own noses with respect to our beliefs about what's good or bad or welcome or unwelcome in grief. I just found I had a really visceral reaction to it. And you and I have talked before about um, other instances like this. So um, chatbots of the dead, the late Roman Mazurenko, who was turned into a chatbot, um, the uh, TV show Meeting You that was done in Korea late last year where um, a woman is reunited with her dead seven-year-old daughter. Yes, another instance of anticipating that, though, having sort of signed off on an informed consent for the show, not knowing, of course, ahead of time what kind of psychological or emotional effect it would have on her. But another thing where after the fact, despite people's horror, the mother in question said, this was really welcome to me. It helped me heal something. It helped me put something to rest. Um, And that often that reaction, which if it was authentic, was often swept aside by people who said, well, no, this is still this is still horrible. As I speak these words, it is February 2021, and we have been in the midst of a global pandemic for over a year. I am alive. I speak to my family and friends on Zoom. When I give lectures, they're often pre-recorded. But I'm here. Three months into his art history class at Concordia University in Canada, one student sent his professor an email. He had a question. He never got an answer. His professor is dead. He'd been dead since 2019. In an article for The Verge, the student said the revelation had completely changed his class experience. I don't really even want to watch his lectures anymore, he says. Participating makes him sad. He tries to space the lectures out between other classes so he can take breaks. It doesn't feel like a class, he says. It feels like one of those websites, like a Skillshare. Digital technologies are now so seamlessly integrated into our lives that we forget how new they are. The first smartphone came out in 2007. In 2004, Facebook and Twitter and YouTube didn't exist. In 1990, when I was at university, there was no such thing as a website. When all of these modern miracles did come about, none of them was designed with the end in mind. Posthumously persistent digital selves are a new thing, and they're fundamentally changing the visibility and role of the dead in society. They challenge our pre-digital systems and laws. Nobody can decide who our digital dead belong to, where they should go, who should control or access them, and even what they are. You have this problem with what what do you do with dead people where do you put them suddenly you have to deal with them and whether you like it or not they will continue to be present among you 